Session one broadly considers methodological approaches and session two um, starts to look at some specific case studies. So I would like to start session one then by introducing our own Barbara Crosby, who's going to be speaking today about age relations and cultural change in 18th century England. So over to you, Barbara. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I shall just share my screen. Um, so I have to admit that the caption um, capture thing has, has been intermittently working, so I apologise if it doesn't work um, the, this afternoon. So this paper takes its name from my new book, which is, uh, so it's a shameless plug, it has to be admitted, which is an explanation of cultural change in England during the second half of the 18th century. But age relations offer a useful lens through which to view the past, regardless of when or where your research focus lies. And it's the value of age relations as a category of historical analysis that I want to focus on today. So I'll be talking a little bit about why I think age relations matter and how they force us to rethink the way historical actors are viewed. And then I'll briefly explain what my investigation of age relations revealed in an 18th century context. I want to start with a quote from um, Sam, um, sorry, um, Samuel Johnson, the um, author and lexicographer. Let's see if we can make the slides change. I don't actually want to put it into a slideshow and I don't know how to. Ah, right, yes, here we go. Nope. Apologies for my incompetence on Google Slides. Um, so, oh, my double apologies for this. I actually have no idea how to stop this from happening. So, the quote I wish to discuss is, every old man complains of the growing depravities of the world, of the petulance and insolence of the rising generation. Um, and surely there's some truth in Johnson's claim. Susan Brigham has even suggested that there's nothing in the world older than the productivity of one generation to reject the beliefs and mores of the last and for the elder generation to despair of rebellious youth. Such age-based fault lines ebb and flow with the rhythms of society and there are evidently times when intergenerational divisions appear more pronounced. But even when generational distinctions are not explicitly confrontational, it's important to remember that they still existed. An octogenarian and their 18-year-old grandchild might occupy the same moment in time, but the life experiences that shape their views are in many ways worlds apart. Moreover, for an individual, the life course marks the passing of time as a series of personal transitional events. And as part of this process, the expectations of youth gradually give way to the experiences of age. Whereas age relations are inextricably linked to historical change, and it is in this case, it is the experiences of the elderly that must eventually give way to the expectations of the rising generations. This generational disjuncture is central to cultural adaptation. And I would argue that customs are most often being transformed as they're passed from one generation to the next. This is not to assume that a generational dynamic was the dominant factor shaping cultural change. Only the age offers a useful framework with which to study the process of social and cultural transition. It's therefore surprising that age relations are not a conventional category of historical analysis in the way that gender or class have been. It's not that age has been overlooked, but stages of the life cycle are often considered in isolation, rendering them static. So we have discrete histories of childhood, youth and old age. And adulthood is generally privileged as the unspoken norm that forms mainstream histories, as though adulthood is not a life stage. In contrast, to recognise the importance of accumulated experiences prevents children and the elderly from being relegated to the sidelines of adult history, and reminds us that it is the relationship between age groups rather than the isolated actions of an age cohort that forge a culture. And yet, even when intergenerational relationships are investigated, limited attention is given to the fact that individuals progressed from childhood to old age, let alone that they did so as part of a generational cohort. 
It is, however, this intrinsic temporality that sets age apart from other social categories and makes age relations a particularly robust tool of historical inquiry. And it is this that I'm at pains to point out. The generational contours of society provide a tangible structure often lacking in cultural histories, um, whilst imposing a chronological precision that can be lost as thematic analysis skips across years, decades and even centuries, thereby making it possible to map the cultural landscape and to expose the incremental and contingent pattern of change. Now, at this point, I think it'll be helpful to shift from the abstract and to explain how I used age as both a, a subject of study and an analytical framework in my exploration of 18th century society. And I'm going to skip the slides because they were just, you know, they were, um, they, they weren't instrumental to what it is that I have to say, and it seems safer to stay with the slide I've got. So, um, I, I, at first, um, the first thing I should point out is that to chart generational change at this time is to question ingrained assumptions. The idea that distinct self-aware social generations um, tends to be associated with the coming of modernity and the, um, in the 19th and 20th centuries. And in his highly influential essay, The Problem of Generations, Karl Menheim argued that it was only after an acceleration in the tempo of change in Europe during the closing decades of the 18th century that such social generations could emerge. Accordingly, E.P. Thompson suggested that 18th century society had not yet reached the point at which it is assumed that the horizons of each successive generation will be different. Generational change is often implied in more recent accounts of the past, even if it's not always explicitly recognised and has not been systematically investigated. But it's fair to say that on the whole, the significance of age relations has been overlooked. So it was in this context that I came across evidence of a politicisation of age during a parliamentary election campaign that took place in Newcastle upon Tyne in 1774. And I realised that I had no idea what age meant to 18th century people, where the fracture lines might lie between generations, or what it was that divided the age groups. In seeking to understand the age-based political faction that I'd uncovered, it quickly became apparent that I needed to figure out not only where the generational gap lay, but what had caused them in the first place. Um, and the ubiquity of age, of the aging process, meant that age relations intersect with other social categories. So this was going to involve investigating much more than age. Consequently, while the book culminates in the political arena of the 1770s, it begins three decades earlier in the nurseries and schoolrooms in which formative years were spent and traverses the volatile terrain of adolescence before turning to the adult world of the 1770s, where, by the way, it transpires that hairstyles, as you can possibly see from this image, um, were one of the things that divided the generations. Following this generational cohort um, in the way that I did through the life stages allowed a cumulative argument to be built, revealing the roots of a generational tension that emerged as the children of the 1740s and 1750s reached adulthood. Yet the chapters are about so much more than a generational divide in the political arena or even an inquiry into how and why this age-based faction arose. Instead, this is a mapping exercise that traces the generational contours of society. It becomes apparent that changing perceptions of childhood during the 1740s were of central importance to the politics of um, the 1770s, but the connections are too complex to assume a direct cause and effect. Changing attitudes towards family life were part of a wide ranging cultural turn during the middle decades of the century. In which progressive cosmopolitan values were re-articulated as less exclusive. The treatment of children was also entwined with ongoing developments in educational practice that were driven, at least in part, by intellectual debates about human nature, the philosophy of language and religious contestation. By 1750, the sequence of factors was acting in tandem with a reorganisation of the apprentice system, in this case influenced by, um, to a significant extent, by unrelated demographic trends and geopolitical events. These issues converged in unanticipated ways, transforming society as the mid-century children grew up and leading to a second wave of generational change as this cohort reached adulthood. And it's this generational division that would eventually spill into the political arena as youthful demands for greater autonomy became conflated with political demands for reforms. 
Investigating age relations provides a structural um, time frame that makes it possible to trace the trajectories of these independent threads of social experience and to see how they intersected with one another. Um, it's this that exposes the manner in which a wide range of factors contributed to a contingent process of change that linked child play to a contested election. This approach does not present an orderly picture of cultural change, but mimicking lived experience, it reveals a cluttered array of crossing points as various causal factors interweave to produce a rich and vibrant social fac fabric. So to conclude, I just want to reiterate the value of age as a category of analysis. To investigate age relations obliges us to recognise that people lived through and not in the past. And as Reinhard Kasselek argued, if history is to be distinguished from the social sciences, it requires a theory that makes it possible to accommodate the changes in temporal experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Barbara. So, because we're so tight for time, moving on immediately, um, now we've got Mark Freeman speaking, um, and he is going to be talking about the redress of the past, an update on historical pageants, research and engagement. So thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for, for attending. It's a real pleasure to be speaking in the um, life cycle strand. As uh, a long time ago, I was one of the, um, one of the first uh, conveners of this strand. So really glad to see it flourishing. The, the aim of this paper is to report and reflect on the various public engagement activities that we've been undertaking during the life of the Redress of the Past project on historical pageants uh, in 20th and early 21st century Britain, and particularly the current follow-on phase, which is uh, like the original phase funded by the um, Arts and Humanities Research Council, to whom we're, we're very grateful. Um, many of you will have seen us speak before. Um, and so, um, I just want to reprise only very briefly what, what a historical pageant was. It's essentially a theatrical representation of successive scenes in the history of a community or an institution, um, usually seen to have kicked off at Sherborne in Dorset in 1905, when the pageant master Louis Napoleon Parker kicked off a wave of pageant fever across the country. Uh, towns and cities up and down uh, Britain um, performed historical pageants. Uh, continues after the First World War, uh, and everyone was at it. We reckon there have been about 10,000 historical pageants in Britain uh, over the past 120 years. The Boy Scouts, the Women's Institutes, cooperative movement, political parties, small villages, but also large towns like Manchester and Birmingham uh, performed pageants. Um, the, the enthusiasm declined from the early 1950s onwards after brief flurries of excitement and pageant fever at the time of the Festival of Britain and the coronation, uh, and the, um, the, the format is relatively little known now. Pageants could be turned to both conservative and progressive ends and much in between. We've presented many papers on this over the past few years, and I haven't time to go um, over this, this ground here. Um, but we feel that pageants have a lot to tell us about um, popular understandings and representations of the past in 20th century Britain and beyond. That's just a picture to give you an idea of the scale of the audiences for some of these things. Preston in 1922, um, sometimes thousands of performers and tens of thousands of spectators. The, uh, our website is kind of our key at, at output and um, it has details of all our publications and the exhibitions that we've staged uh, and the pageant database and interactive map. Um, which has about one and a half million words of text uh, on 656 pageants, including extended synopses of content and um, write-ups kind of mini social histories in, in each case. Uh, public engagement, so in phase one, we worked with a number of project partners um, in Carlisle and Scarborough, Bury St Edmunds and St Albans to create exhibitions and events in various locations across England. And in phase two, we're working with the Glasgow Women's Library as well, although this is one of the activities that has been postponed, postponed but not cancelled due to the pandemic. We've also worked in, in Sherborne, the, the, the spiritual home of pageantry, with the local history society there, where the original pageant of 1905 elicits a lot of uh, interest still locally. What we uncovered, to, to cut a very long story short, is a widespread enthusiasm among local history communities for the study, 
uh, and, and also the commemoration of historical pageants that were staged there. Film showings in Bury St Edmunds were particularly popular. We had to stage additional screenings to accommodate local demand. Um, we showed both silent and sound films, colour and black and white, adding our own commentary. Uh, and in doing this, we're also prompting memory. We carried out oral history interviews with pageant performers from 1959 and 1970 in Bury St Edmunds. Uh, but also we were illustrating aspects of the history uh, uh, of this community and others to, to their newer members. In phase two, we are working with a number of new partners and some old ones, um, the English Folk Dance and Song Society. There is an exhibition now extended till next year and an event postponed to next year at Cecil Sharp House in London, which I hope many will be able to, to visit and attend, or all free of course. Uh, in St Albans we have had um, exhibitions and events including musical performance of pageant music, often never performed since its uh, original outing. Um, the Trestle Theatre Company, a nationally renowned mask theatre company, have re-performed pageant scenes with their local youth theatre group and we've um, undertaken film showings of some of the wonderful film footage that the local pageants here in St Albans where I live, um, uh, uh, the, we have some wonderful footage surviving. We're also working with the Axbridge pageant scheduled for 2020, now postponed um, a decennial pageant since um, 1970. Um, pageants have often though by no means always featured a very elite centred version of the past and of course this is encouraged by the lavish costume, perhaps also the episodic structure of um, pageants which although I wouldn't press this point might sort of lend itself to a sort of Whiggish narrative progressive account of the past. But pageants have often, not least during the Festival of Britain, focused on the so-called ordinary man, ordinary woman, and it's often local social and cultural history that makes its way into the few pageants that survive today, like Axbridge, as well as the community play movement that flourished through the 1970s and into the 1980s. So one example, this Axbridge pageant, um, which has around 400 performers in a town of around 2,000 people and here the producer John Bailey has evolved the scenes and scripts to present a much more community-centred, perhaps even radical interpretation of, of the local past. Some general reflections, what we found is two groups have been particularly engaged with our work. Firstly, people with pageant memories themselves, generally older people for whom performing in a pageant often really was a very important moment in their life. Um, and this is really echoed in our oral histories where people speak quite movingly of the impact that acting in a pageant had on them. <clears throat> but also, um, and I'll show an example of this, newcomers to an area who want to learn more about the history of the place and have come along to our events. And I think both these types of engagement reflect the importance of projects like ours to the communities that we work with and of pageants themselves as community events that work in very different ways for, for different people. So just from one of our, our feedback forms here, um, somebody writing, I've retired to Bury St Edmunds and in order to feel at home here, I try to find out as much about the town as I can. It seems to be a very vibrant town with enthusiastic people today. Can pageants survive in today's climate of mass media? They should. They bring together people together with a common, if mad, purpose. They're very inclusive. I think it's a matter of debate as to how inclusive pageants were or could be. We've written a lot about this. But there is a sense of the potential, at least, that large-scale civic activities can have for community cohesion. In fact, um, the, the Berry, the last pageant in 1970, was um, widely criticised for not being very inclusive, for its middle-class bias, and indeed there was a counter-pageant staged by a group of more politically radical younger people to protest against um, what, what they saw as the elite-centred narrative and, and middle-class bias of the main pageant. Um, we discussed the extents and limits to this inclusivity in our various publications, but it is interesting that some of our respondents in their feedback forms have, have picked up on, on, this, on this aspect. Um, it's clearly possible, I think, for pageants and to elicit a nostalgic response. A lot of the feedback has um, generated a rather socially conservative reaction in the sense of nostalgia for a particular version of the urban community that respondents associated with the production of pageants. Uh, sometimes this has been explicitly related to an apparent loss of natural patriotism, but 
we wouldn't necessarily want to endorse these responses, but it is worth acknowledging, I think, the variety of responses we've had, which demonstrates, I think, exactly why pageants had a wide appeal at the time. They could and did mean very different things to different people. Um, but I think what's important is that responses often went beyond the nostalgic and demonstrated that for some attenders, our events on pageants have elicited reflective thoughts along a number of lines. Um, one, um, some of them have really prompted some historical thinking about the nature of community life. One respondent in Sherborne combined an idea of pride in place with some reflections on the nature of the community in the past. I'm very proud of the place that Sherborne has as the mother of pageants, he or she said. I will be interested to find out more about the selection of caste to discover whether social status played a role in this. And this is exactly what's happening. The Local History Society in Sherborne is embarking on a project to trace through record linkage the 800 or so participants in the pageant and to identify the, the social um, characteristics of, of the pageanteers. We've prompted, I think, some local research and reflection and, and, and we've tapped into an existing culture of local memory, local memorialization of pageants. This goes back a long way. So Sherborne Pageant Gardens on the left of this slide and also a, a memorial to the 1959 Bury St Edmunds pageant on, on the right. The, these memorializations do demonstrate the importance uh, the, uh, of pride in place, which is so often reflected in our, in our feedback forms. Um, and this is true in most places, particularly Axbridge, where although most of those who run and lead the pageant are the recent um, migrants to the town, or relatively recent, um, they have really generated and, and uh, that they, they built on and generated a sense of enthusiasm. And it may be that the enthusiasm for pageants in the past is still worth commemorating. And perhaps some, some inspiration might be drawn from these levels of enthusiasm as, uh, as local communities evolve their, their own understandings of, of history in the future. We've certainly stimulated a lot of local interest and local research, uh, and we hope to continue to do that once we get sort of back into action again after this pandemic is over. Um, these are some resources you can you can access via our website. Uh, my own book on the St Albans pageants, which I'm afraid is not free, um, but the other books are free. Historical Pageants Local History Study Guide, which uh, details some of our local collaborations, and a forthcoming open access book, Restaging the Past, an edited collection, which will be available from August onwards. You can download both of these for free from our website. So thank you very much for listening and um, I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much. That was a masterclass in um, fitting quite a lot in, in 10 minutes then. Well done. Um, thank so, you <laughs> so finally in this panel we've got Imogen Peck who is going to be talking about the family archive in early modern Britain, challenges and approaches. So over to you Imogen. Hello, um, and thank you very much everyone for pulling this together. Um, I'll begin this by saying this is kind of a work research project that's in its very early stages. So any and all questions, however critical, are very welcome. Um, I'm gonna start with a quick story um, about a vicar from Olney in North Buckinghamshire called Wolsey Johnson. In 1756, Wolsey died. And then in the weeks and months following his death, his widow, Jane began the task of sorting and arranging his papers, deciding which items were worth preserving and which might safely be consigned to the fire. While the cachets of various wills, deeds and legal papers possessed a clear practical value, the status of his other written remains was less certain. Can I work out how to change the slides? Here we go. In a note penned on the back of one memorandum, Jane expressed this ambivalence. The other side of this paper was wrote by the Reverend Wolsey Johnson. I apprehend it can be of no use. This is in some ways a rather paradoxical annotation. On the one hand, Jane acknowledged that the paper was, in her self-consciously subjective opinion, of no use. And yet, in spite of this, she went to the trouble of inscribing and keeping it. When Jane herself died three years later, her papers passed her eldest child and only daughter, Barbara, who in turn sorted, annotated and preserved various items, including this apparently useless memorandum. 
So over the last two decades, historians have begun to approach the archive, not just as a tool for historical study, but as its subject. This archival turn has encouraged scholars to interrogate the surge in public and private documentation that occurred after 1500, and some of the social, cultural and political structures that lay behind its preservation. To date, however, the majority of studies have tended to concentrate on papers produced by institutions and by officials, often with an emphasis on the ways in which the acceleration of archival activity fueled and mirrored the growth of the early modern state. By comparison, we still know relatively little about collections accumulated by and which circulated within families. Though historians regularly mine family collections for material on a wide range of subjects, they have rarely been considered as objects worthy of study in their own right. The Johnson papers are a pretty typical example of this. Um, they've been deployed in lots of studies of evidence of epistolary literacy, female literary culture, educational practices, even consumption and fashion, but they've not been approached as a cohesive family archive, one which was deliberately collected, curated, and then communicated across multiple generations. There are, I think, a number of possible reasons the early modern household remains, as Lifebus Corins, Kate Peters and Alexandra Walsham have put it, a dimension of archival history that deserves more thorough investigation, some practical and some more theoretical. At the more conceptual end of the spectrum are debates over precisely what constitutes an archive in the early modern period. Where once scholars tended to limit the term to collections that were the product of political power, um, thus the emphasis on states and officials and institutions, the new social history of archives, pioneered by figures like Marcus Friedrich and Alexander Walsham, deploys the term rather more expansively to refer to a whole range of physical repositories in which items were stored. By these lights, the materials that families like the Johnsons kept in their various boxes, chests and drawers can perhaps fruitfully be approached as archives. Perhaps more substantial still are some of the various practical hurdles. Um, though many family papers were passed from one generation to the next, various deaths, relocations and remarriages often led to the dispersal of family material. Papers were often separated, lost, or in some more illustrious cases, bought up by manuscript collectors and antiquarians and then absorbed into larger collections. Many are now divided across multiple repositories and even where they have been reunited, processes of ordering and cataloguing have often destroyed much of their original arrangement. This poses some inevitable difficulties when attempting to reconstruct the ways that papers were assembled, deployed, and the meanings that they possessed for those who preserved them and for future generations who then went on to do the same. The Johnson papers, for example, are now split between several different archives, um, including the Bodleian, and in that um, instance, they've been catalogued as the papers of each individual family member and placed folio by folio into books, um, an arrangement that goes somewhere, I think, to obscuring their intergenerational character and also the archival activities of the Johnson women who were involved in arranging and preserving them. Yet, in spite of some of these challenges, I'd like to contend that by paying careful attention to the contents and material features of surviving family papers, as well as traces of their use and later refashioning, illuminating the life and afterlives of family archives is not only possible, um, but also has the potential to cast significant light on the role that these construct collections played in constructing and communicating family memory and identity across generations on a way and on the ways in which these practices were influenced by and in their turn influenced broader religious, political and cultural developments. As literacy spread and the quantity and diversity of written materials increased, which papers to keep, both for oneself and for posterity, was an issue that confronted increasing numbers of men and women from across the social spectrum. Family archives, once perhaps principally places to preserve monuments and evidences, that demonstrated various legal rights and commitments, began to adopt a wide range of other functions and meanings that reflected the changing ambitions and anxieties of early modern men and women. So I guess in very brief, that's kind of the aim and the ambition of the bigger project that I'm now trying to work on, um, to produce a social history of the family archive that runs from the late 16th century, when the diversity of material in family collections begins to really pick up, um, through to the 19th century, when the Public Record Office is first founded. <laughs>
And I think clearly one of the stories there will be the ways in which family collecting intersects with some of these broader state-based archival activities, um, not least because in this period the line between personal and family papers and public collections remains one that's very porous. So for the short amount of time that I've got left, what I'd like to do is just take a couple of examples from the papers of the Johnson family um, in order to demonstrate first what I guess it might look like or what it might mean to read these ar materials as archive, and second what doing so reveals about the nature of 18th century family collections and the role that women played in their construction and curation, and also some of the anxieties that these activities provoked among their architects and their heirs. So to return then to the memorandum which Jane regarded as being of no use, um, this isn't the only time we can perceive a tension between an item's lack of obvious utility and a desire to keep paperwork that can possess some kind of commemorative and sentimental significance in the Johnson collection. This here is another note, originally attached to a parcel of letters written by her parents-in-law to their son. And here Jane makes the distinction between the practical and the memorial value of written remains quite explicit. This parcel of letters are of no sort of use, she commented, before continuing. I only keep them because they were wrote by Thomas and Anne Johnson, whose pictures are drawn with a great dog. These letters were wrote to them by their son, William Johnson, whose picture is drawn a little boy with his hair over his forehead, and so on. Once again, Jane acknowledged that the letters were of no use. Yet, as she continued to write, she justified her decision to keep them by outlining the role that they played in commemorating several family members who were now dead. In so doing, she integrated the letters into the wider domestic space, linking them to a series of portraits that depicted the deceased correspondence. Such connections highlight, I think, the fact that family archives were often part of a broader web of memory work their purpose and meaning embedded within a domestic environment which has now been lost in their transition from the home to the record office. The increasingly effective and commemorative functions of family paperwork are also discernible in the activities of Jane's daughter, Barbara, who inherited her collection and who also appended items with future-oriented notes that sought to explain their contents and character for the benefit of posterity. Um, I think the clearest example of this probably is the note she penned here. Um, this is on the back of a copy of one of her mother's letters and it reads to Henrietta Ingram, then 14 after her first visit to Oni, and so on. She says, this letter was the origin of the friendship between our families and the Ingrams, which has continued ever since and been a source of great happiness to Barbara Johnson, who desires that it may be preserved. For Barbara then, the letter is the origin of and a monument to an important friendship. And particularly revealing, I think, here are the last few words of this annotation. Like her mother before her, Barbara, the living writer of the note, absents herself in order to establish a version of Barbara Johnson that is integrated into and becomes an object contained within the archive. She speaks to future readers of her commemorative aspirations in the third person, hopeful that she has justified this letter's place in the collection. She also attempts to preserve her own emotional feelings. Um, it's an act of family history, but it also preserves Barbara's happiness and her feelings about the friendship. So here the agencies of the archives users resonate through the generations as Barbara imagines future curators of the archive in some manner beholden to or influenced by this desire she has that this material might be preserved. So to conclude then, um, I guess far from being a random assortment of items that languished unloved and undisturbed before eventually being tipped into institutional archives, these collections were sites of a lively discourse that can reveal much about the intentions and priorities of those who encountered and engaged with them, and the shifting value that was attributed to family paperwork. They were multi-layered, palimpsestic, polyvocal spaces, where issues of memory and identity were constructed and then reconstructed and contested. As their unintended and probably unimagined future readers, they require historians to pay closer attention to the presences, absences, and impetuses which lay behind their curation. And I guess that is what this paper is a very tentative first step towards doing. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Imogen. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Warwick. Her research area is domestic solitude, and she's going to be discussing today how different stages in the life cycle
affected gendered experiences of solitude. So over to you, Naomi. Okay. Um, hopefully, one minute. Yeah, this is the first time I've done this, so I'm hoping that all works for everyone. And um, so, thank you, first of all, for organising this session and for all the really thought-provoking papers we've had so far. Uh, in my paper today, I am going to be exploring the experience of domestic solitude and I'd specifically like to discuss how different moments in the life cycle affected the gendered experiences of solitude. I'm going to ask whether women experience solitude differently from men and why, and what was the impact of the domestic environment on how solitude and sociability were experienced. This fits into a monograph um, which is still in its very early stages um, which is on the gendered experiences of solitude and sociability in 17th and 18th century Britain and it contemplates the different emotional, spiritual, psychological um, and physiological impacts of being alone. The men and women I'm studying who were mainly from the middling and upper ranks were part of a society where sociability, or at least appearing to be sociable, was of increasing importance to their reputation and honour. The early modern home, um, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, was a space that lent itself to a number of practices of sociability, and where many of the ties of friendship were conducted, whether that was through face-to-face -face visits, reading and writing letters, or in the exchange of gifts and other material goods and services. At the same time, the home was also a space that represented isolation and physical separation from communities and social groups, which could have significant consequences for those who spent large periods of time at home. This has particular implications, I think, for women, um, especially women of the middling and upper ranks, whose identity centred around the household. Marriage, I think, is a particularly interesting moment in the life cycle when solitude and isolation might be felt most acutely. For women, this is the moment when they relinquish not only their legal and civic identity to their husbands, but also a great deal of their social independence. This meant that decisions about how they spent their time and with whom were frequently out of their control, as their sociability was often dependent on forging connections with their husbands, business associates, kin, or other social acquaintances, rather than with uh, the, their friend, the friends and acquaintances of their youth. As historian Catherine Glover writes, whilst marriage might pro provide agency and autonomy for some women, it could also be restrictive and uh, it could also be a restrictive and at times lonely experience for those who marry, whose married homes were country houses far from their family or other female company. Establishing new friendships moreover took time. Many newly married women acutely felt the lack of female companionship to which they had become accustomed in their youths. When the gentlewoman Alice Thornton married in 1651, she described how marriage had placed her in a situation so remote from all my own relations and friends that she feared I might be um, in um, might be in a suffering condition for the want of their advice and assistance. And unlike the sociability to which many young women were able to engage. Marriage also came with responsibility, which prevented them from undertaking the same types of visits to the houses of friends and family elsewhere in the country. Moreover, motherhood and other domestic responsibilities also drastically limited the amount of time um, that uh, women had to communicate with and correspond to uh, diff distant friends and relatives. The paradox, however, is that despite the fact that women tended to spend the largest amount of time within the home, the discourse on solitude viewed it as a state that was only suitable to men because it provided a contrast to their more active and public facing duties. Women's time spent within the household was rarely conceived as solitary. 
They were also considered the more sociable of the two sexes. And since they were believed to lack the same intellectual um, capacity and thus the rationality and self-control needed for solitary pursuits, they were not believed to be suited to spending lengthy periods of time alone. This was encapsulated by the 18th century poet Mary Chudley, who regarded solitude as a masculine pleasure and advised her female readers that solitude ought never to be our choice and active life is much greater perfection. One of the major challenges I've been facing in carrying out a study that aims to explore the everyday practices of solitude is finding examples of 17th and 18th century male writers who openly discuss and contemplate their time spent alone. The great irony is that because men are regarded as better suited to solitude and were expected to use the privacy of the home as a refuge from their public duties, the time that they do spend alone rarely figure in figures in their personal writings or ego documents. And when solitude is discussed by men, it tends to be in a literary or didactic form rather than in an experiential sense. So if anyone has any thoughts or suggestions about how I might be able to overcome this challenge, I'd be very welcome. In the rest of this discussion, I'm going to provide a case study of one woman's conflicting experiences of domestic solitude. Lady Anne Dormer, um, a gentlewoman from Oxfordshire, had a particularly complex relationship with both sociability and solitude following her unhappy marriage to Robert Dormer. In 1668, she married and moved to Dormer's estate at Rousham, where she was separated from family and friends and found she had little company, except among her much um, lower social ranking neighbours. Although her household was a bustling place, um, with lots of so, so, uh, servants and 11 children, she found adjusting to this more solitary and less sociable life incredibly challenging. In 1685, in one of the first of a series of letters that she sent to her sister, Lady Elizabeth Trumbull, she extolled the emotional and domestic benefits of her private closet, which she described as a safe shelter where she could read and write in privacy. She contrasted this with the chaotic and overbearing domestic situation out of it, where she said she could find little quiet. She attributed this lack of domestic solitude to her relationship with her tyrannical husband, Robert, who was violent, controlling and abusive. As a respectable gentlewoman, she attempted to maintain the hospitality, social visiting and metropolitan sociability expected of a woman of her rank. Yet she confessed that her married state had altered her views on time spent in company. She wrote how she found more true joy in one day when I am quite alone than ever I did in the height of my youth when I was in the midst of jollity. When she reflected on the social visits she and her husband made to London early in their marriage, she lamented how his continual rudeness and public shaming had encouraged her to actively shun company and seek refuge at home. In one letter, she commented that she would only adventure abroad with Robert um, if he was civil to her at home. Um, and her reason uh, for this uh, was because she said that she could more easily bear a private affront than a public one. Perpetually poised between a love of being alone and a yearning for company, Anne Dormer's unhappy domestic situation had a significant impact on how she came to understand and express solitude. She used her letters to her sister Elizabeth as a kind of surrogate for the lack of companionship she was experiencing within the household. She explained um, in another of her letters that the only pleasure I have is in this talking. Um, and when she says talking, she means writing to and, and corresponding with her friends. It creates happiness within that very miserable domestic situation. A withdrawn and solitary state thus led her to cherish the epistolary relationships she was able to maintain through her letters, even if they were only imagined rather than physical 
encounters. Um, and Orma's story, I think, is um, particular, a particularly poignant example of how early modern women spoke about, overcame and experienced domestic solitude. It also shows how different stages in the life cycle, in this case marriage, directly impinged on how her opportunities for sociability changed and how um, she came to experience solitude. But it does raise one of the methodological challenges I have been facing, which is the question of how far the life cycle can be separated from the domestic experience of solitude, especially for women. Are they two sides of the same coin or is it worth separating out domestic experiences from life cycle moments? Um, especially when also considering how men um, encounter solitude as well. But I do think that in looking at domestic experiences of solitude, we can see how the sense of social isolation was far more common than previous histories of early modern um, sociability have hitherto acknowledged. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Naomi. That was fascinating. Um, so now we have Ellen Smith, who is a PhD student at University of Leicester. Uh, do you want to share your screen now, Ellen? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Ellen's going to talk about, Ellen's research is on communication networks among individuals in colonial South Asia and how they're related to families back in Britain. Thanks, Morg. Uh, hello, and um, thank you to the Social History Society for developing an excellent series of events and to our organisers for this particular strand. Um, so my research as a whole explores the communicative processes taking place um, within British families when individuals in those groups were scattered across the empire during the long 19th century. To understand how imperial families functioned and coped with such mobility, I use first-hand accounts, for instance, the tenderly written letters that wives sent to their absent husbands who were working in South Asia, or those from parents to children. Yet familial letters often served a higher purpose than simply to sustain intimacy in the face of regular cycles of distance and absence that a career in India necessitated as a civil servant, a missionary or a soldier. Rather, as I begin to explore in this paper, we can identify subtle performances of power at play within letters that help to illuminate the perhaps unexpected centra centrality of women who were generally writing such letters in constructing the narratives that upheld the imperial project. So, the linguistic techniques and narratives used in letters ebbed and flowed throughout the century according to the context or circumstances in which they were written. My research differentiates between the letter conven conventions and patterns associated with A, writing in moments of crisis in colonial spaces, and B, writing in circumstances of normal or everyday life and routine, what Jeffrey Auerbach has recently called the constant and unrelenting daily backdrop of imperial boredom. Ideas about so-called Indian otherness um, were constructed and shared in personal letters, further bridging the divide between metropole and colony, a, pro a process which is more commonly attributed to advertising, travel and literature. The historiography surrounding imperial letter writing is rich, but the importance of letter writing, which is assumed to be a feminised womanly activity to the work of empire building, can easily be underestimated. In particular, Erica Rappaport's work on the revealing nature of the silences, absences and miscommunications of letters is insightful. Um, I'll now move on to some examples of the letters written, first in moments of crisis and secondly during periods of normality, and draw out some of the ways that silences and absences could serve a distinct purpose. <laughs> 
So many historians have started to speak of the British Raj in terms of anxiety, insurgence and fear. I approach letter writing as a means for the British to construct stories and images of India that brought order to a context of disorder and confusion. Right, family writers also use letters to contribute and align themselves to discourses around imperial power and control. For instance, my research into the 1857 Indian Rebellion has recently shown me that correspondents living through this moment of crisis could deploy certain techniques or devices to emphasise their suffering and thereby heighten the concern of their family in the metropole. When the Indian infantry mutinied in 1857, triggering a series of attacks against the British community, letters were often the only means of news reporting and they were not unaware of the effect of the news they imparted. They tugged on the heartstrings of a British audience who believed that women were being defiled, tortured and raped by Indian men by writing about how inexplicable and terrible the events were, but rarely expanding upon the finer details of such. As Jenny Sharp has argued, absence or silence encouraged concerned families and friends at home to start reading between the lines and suspecting the worst when presented with deliberately evasive or ambiguous accounts. This was not only the case for 1857 either. Correspondents prompted their recipients to imagine a whole host of, um, quote, threats that could come from venturing in colonial spaces. The wife of Captain George Peary worked along these lines in her communication. In 1868, she told her mother that her son's illness caused by an accident with the household servants was too serious to even expand upon. Um, quoting here, I can rarely spend a minute from him to write to you. She, repeat she repeatedly notes the extremity of the situation simply by her incapacity to, de to describe it. Enhancing the suffering that these letters implied or insinuated was not simply a unique mode of reporting. I argue it was driven by an imperial mentality to mark India as something dangerous or other to Britain. So uh, long passages about the seemingly mundane and innocent everyday rhythms of life were just as highly charged as those letters about crisis, violence and resistance in the colonies, and just as revealing about the dynamics of imperial rule. Yet whereas an absence of written information can be telling in crisis letters, an excess of writing about seemingly mundane matters, such as the weather or domestic chores, is a significant feature in this last section. So Laura Ishiguro has likewise noted a particular affinity of the settlers of British Columbia to write about the everyday, or what she terms, quote, their discursive erasures. So erasing the messier, more violent encounters of colonisation and writing about the more casual details of life gave settlers, according to Ishiguro, claims of legitimacy, legitimacy to be there. Thus, we can see how the communications that were necessary to keep the imperial family together in the 19th century could be used for political ends. An overwhelming majority of the letters I have so far examined, written during periods of peace, devote much of their time describing the unbearable quality of the tropical climate and their heat-induced fatigue. Repeated discussions about the weather in my sets of letters uh, help to mimic the day-to-day -day conversations that were typical of families who lived under one roof and therefore attempted to lessen the feelings of distance and absence. However, this genre of writing was also embedded in racial and imperial discourses of the time. Such excessive commentary on their inability to adjust to the heat of the subcontinent allowed writers to state their aversion to a so-called, uh, quote, native way of life. Writing of their inability to acclimatise enabled them to assert the continued strength of a British national identity that they um, subscribed to. So to conclude, um, the histories of imperial families and family communications can make important interventions in the debates around imperial politics and empire building. 
the letters written by the British in India on matters pertaining to the weather, the everyday, or in contrast, anxiety and danger, reveal so much more than simply the uniqueness of family life in, coloni in a colonial context. Living in a moment of national and global crisis ourselves in the present day, where communicating at a distance is becoming the, the norm, it is ever more important to be aware of the political and power agendas at stake within the ways we ourselves communicate as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. A very good point at the end there. <laughs> uh, great presentation. Um, right now, uh, next up is Laura Ugolini, uh, who's from the University of Wolverhampton. Do you want to share your screen now, um, Laura? Um, and Laura's project is focusing on how families in the first two decades of the 20th century dealt with mental illness and looking at appeals against military service. Right, I hope you can, uh, this is showing okay. Yep. I know I've been very jealous of um, Ellen and um, uh, Naomi's uh, captures because <laughs> the captures are on, but I don't think it, it particularly likes my Italian accent. So hopefully, some yes, yeah, <laughs> so hopefully something will appear at some point. So anyway, I think that uh, uh, to call this um, um, an ongoing project is probably an exaggeration. In fact, we probably can't really even call this uh, uh, work in progress presentation it probably is more best be described as uh, work in the planning presentation because what I would like to, to do today is to suggest pr present uh, um, ideas about the project that I am planning to undertake so really would be very grateful for any suggestions or feedback. Now the starting point for this uh, project uh, are actually um, a source, a set of sources uh, that uh, I used um, to some extent in uh, previous projects and perhaps more recently in a project that I did on the relationship between fathers and sons and the, the sources are appeals against conscription during the records of appeals against conscription during the First World War and the two sets of sources in particular that I would like to use for this new project are firstly the Middlesex Military Service Appeal Tribunal records and there's about 8,000 of, uh, of those so it is a, a very large set of uh, records as well as the, the records of the Mid-Staffordshire Military Service Appeal Tribunal and that's rather smaller set of records, 2700, around 2,700, and, but still, as you can see, quite a sizable set of uh, records, and mostly they date between 1916 and 1918, so the period of conscription during the First World War. Now, we tend to think about these um, appeals against conscription as being based made on the basis of uh, conscientious objection. Um, <laughs> just been distracted by my captions. I'm, I'm not talking about ASDA, um, but uh, uh, most of these records actually are based, most of these appeals are actually based on a whole range of uh, motivations. So men made uh, appeals also on uh, a great number of these appeals were also made on the basis of family and uh, domestic responsibilities. So, so almost accidentally these records actually provide us with a good deal of information about um, family relationships, um, family links, responsibilities and, uh, and networks. And one of the arguments, one of the themes uh, that uh, emerges, one of the said um, frequently but certainly regularly is is an argument about the need for the men to stay at home in order to um, uh, to fulfill the responsibilities towards uh, um, towards their family, including mentally ill person within the family, or some of the the, uh, the appeals are also made on the basis of the person's own mental illness. So, so I think that these these uh, records can actually provide us with a good deal of information about how families, and I've written about. Edwardian England, but actually I think it's probably more Georgian England and wartime England 
and about how families uh, coped uh, with the mental illness of one of their members. So, so what I want to do for the rest of this brief presentation is actually to suggest uh, some of the questions that I think uh, this material can provide uh, some answers uh, at least, to some suggestions at least. To now the first question is about uh, who actually does uh, the caring, who is uh, responsible for looking after uh, the, uh, the person who is suffering from mental illness or mental incapacity. Now, to some extent, I don't actually expect to find anything very different from what we might expect about um, gender division of labour in, um, in caring responsibilities. So I'm sure, and in fact, already has emerged, the, the significance of women's role in looking after somebody who's suffering from mental illness. So, but I think already from just looking at this material very briefly for previous projects, what emerges is also the importance of who is actually mentally ill in order to explain who is looking after them. And the first presentation in this session, for example, mentioned the importance of age. And I think that the gender and age of the person who is mentally ill is also significant in sometimes explaining the role of men also in looking after the, the person, in particular certain roles within as uh, carers. So, so consider, for example, this, uh, uh, the case of uh, Benjamin Pope uh, and uh, his father obviously suffered from what is, must have been a ca pretty catastrophic stroke uh, in February 1916. As you can see, his mind is described as a blank uh, and at times gives vent to very great rage. Uh, now, obviously within the family, there were others present. Uh, the mother and the sisters were present, but it's assumed that it's Benjamin who has to do some things for his uh, for his father. That his sisters, uh, it's explicitly stated, could not, uh, such as bathing and sundry other things, which I think must mean dressing, grooming, helping him to go to the toilet, and things uh, things such as that. So I think there is a role here also for men in undertaking some caring responsibilities. The second question of uh, four questions that I think uh, we can ask of this material is about um, how do families cope? What is the place of the mentally ill person within the, uh, within the family? Do we actually see the mentally ill person being integrated within family life? Or is the mentally ill person just somebody who needs to be controlled and uh, sort of managed? The, and the material that she provides both. Um, uh, examples of uh, this. Consider, for example, James Plumpton's father, who's described as unmanageable and a positive danger to mother and sisters. Thus, James Plumpton emphasized the need, the fact that he needs to stay at home to, uh, to help them out. And in this case, uh, James Plumpton's father is very much seen as somebody who just needs to be managed, controlled, and uh, kept safe. But on the other hand, consider the example of uh, Charles Rich's father, or Charles Richard, whose father finds him work in his own firm. And reading between the lines, it's clear from the employees that she put up with him because they're, they want to keep also uh, Charles Rich's father's services. And they describe his behavior. I think Charles Richard, Richards is described as um, suffering from neurasthenia. They describe his uh, mental health as curious uh, and very indifferent. Uh, but nevertheless, it's clear that Charles Richards, nevertheless, he still has um, some kind of a lifestyle that is um, something like a normality for a lower middle class uh, young man as, um, as he was. So again, integration or separation. I think that's something that needs to be investigated uh, further. My third question is uh, the question of uh, the relationship between family and institutional care, which I think is something that uh, already historians of uh, uh, mental health have paid quite a good deal of attention to. And I think that what the what the material really already shows is that they were not mutually exclusive, that people tended to move in and out of family and institutional care, as in the case of, again, James Plumpton's father, who had actually spent, we are told, eight years in a lunatic asylum before his mother uh, brought him home in 1910 sadly thinking he was cured but this has turned out not to be the case but also the other thing that 
and quite interesting finding out from this material is the extent to which mentally the mentally ill person actually had contact with um, the medical establishment, uh, even if it wasn't um, institutional care specialist or just a general medical uh, intervention or did families try to keep these um, mentally ill persons um, health a, a secret and there's at least one case in which uh, the family was, were clearly trying to keep uh, the, the mental illness of one person or uh, wife or mother a secret including from the wider, wider family but I mustn't get distracted from that um, very by that very very interesting uh, case and my final question in this very brief overview of questions that i don't really have any answers as you will have guessed uh, yet uh, has to do with uh, the mentally ill person's own voice their own agency do we see in these sources uh, the, the person who is suffering from mental illness uh, do they have any, are they just acted upon or do they have any autonomy, any independence? And for the most part, this in the majority of sources, they do, they are spoken of, they are acted on. But there are also some other interesting snippets appear. So consider, for example, the case of um, Horace Barrett Beckett, who is a clerk. He appealed against conscription on the grounds that insanity was uh, strongly developed in his family. Uh, that affected his mother, who he describes having died a violent death, uh, as well as his father, and speculate about what had happened in this, uh, in this family. But rather more Horribly, he also says that while well, symptoms have shown himself uh, as confirmed by doctor. So I guess that here we can actually be struck by the really rather sad family history. But also there's something else that I think is worth noting in this case. Note, for example, how um, um, he is, uh, Horace Barrett, Barrett Beckett, is suffering from symptoms of, of uh, mental illness and yet he obviously still works, he still manages to keep a job as a clerk. He has obviously come, come, um, uh, visited a doctor to try and uh, well, consult him about his symptoms presumably and third, I think perhaps more significantly, he is appealing on his own behalf. He is speaking about his own experiences of mental uh, mental illness. So again, perhaps even within this material, uh, we might actually find evidence of uh, um, the mentally ill person's own voice, own sense of uh, autonomy. So that's just a very brief overview of some of the questions that I would like to ask of this material. And I'm asked here to um, please do ask any questions, but I would also appreciate any answers uh, if anybody has uh, any. So thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. What a fascinating resource. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions about it. Um, so moving on to our final participant today is Hazel Vosper who is a PhD student at the University of Lancaster um, and her paper focuses on women's investments in the context of marriage settlements in late 19th and early 20th century England. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Great. Um, thanks for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, although you introduced me in saying what my paper is going to be about, actually I'm not really going to talk about that. Um, I'm really pleased that I'm the last person to present in this group because I think of what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, five to ten minutes being more uh, what we what I would have really liked to talk to you in the coffee break in between. Um, it's a sort of methodology issue that I'm struggling with and I'd really like to hear if anybody's got any advice or else even just some sympathy or you know if you've got the same issue. Um, and, and the issue I'm going to talk about is the necessity to over rely on a single secondary source. Um, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, marriage settlements though as part of this. Um, most of you are probably familiar with marriage settlements and what I'm going to just show here is a very, very simplified view. They're not homogenous in any way. They also go back a long way. They were introduced by the Normans. Um, uh, and, and as most of you will probably know, in the 18th and 19th century, um, there were 
uh, used um, because of a loss of legal identity that occurred when women married. Um, they basically took on or, uh, the legal identity of their husbands, uh, coverture, so they were covered by the legal identity of their husband. Uh, and so marriage settlements were put in place by families who were attempting to protect the financial well-being of their daughter and of her children. Now the protection was both during marriage, but we tend to forget it was also about widowhood as well. Um, they were trying to ensure that family property she brought into the marriage uh, continued to be protected. Uh, marriage settlements were basically a settlement of assets but they were held within a legal trust um, and this came under equity law, not common law. Um, these trusts were overseen by independent trustees uh, in the interest of the beneficiaries. Now the terms of the trust deed, because a trust deed had to be written for each trust, were often very complex. Um, settlers needed to anticipate multiple family scenarios um, and they had to think about things like what happened if there were children from previous marriage that were had to be thought of. They had to consider what happened in, in terms of which spouse died first. They had to look at multiple generations and anticipate some of the issues that might arise. So trust deeds can be quite challenging to read sometimes. Another thing to say about trust deeds, um, there, there wasn't a one size fits all. The settler had a lot of power um, and one of the powers was what they could allow the beneficiary or beneficiaries to do or not do. So in certain trust deeds the beneficiary was just a sort of dumb recipient if you like of, 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 of money and capital yeah. um, according to, to um, uh, the management of the trust by the trustees. But in other cases the beneficiary um, had the power to um, uh, elect uh, a new trustee when one of the old trustees died or, or, or retired uh, and they also um, had the power to say what happened to their investments. Um, so the trustees were really quite complex. Um, the role of the trustee itself was very difficult. Um, it was unpaid, it was seen as being an honorary thing that you would do for your friends and acquaintances because of this cross-generational aspect, there was a long-term commitment. Um, uh, trustees had personal liability, and so the law courts, the chancery courts, were full of um, cases of trustees being um, taken to court because they were personally liable for a loss or, or, or not managing the trust in, in the right way. There were no specific qualifications to be a, a trustee, even though trust matters could be firstly very legally complex uh, and also require a lot of financial knowledge. And as I say, it was a difficult role, but well-to-do men, especially during the Victorian period, would be asked many times over by their friends and acquaintances to take on this role. It should be said also that trustees quite often had to have quite good knowledge of the family uh, if they did take it, uh, uh, such a role on. Um, it wasn't just a question of, of managing uh, a set of assets of property or shares or whatever. Sometimes they, they were asked to run a business until a son could reach his majority, or quite often they had to take uh, responsibility for the supervision of the education and the upbringing of, of infant children. So an extremely difficult role to take on. Now, for historians, especially historians of the late Victorian period, there are just so many different ways in which you can think about or, or um, uh, analyse uh, marriage settlements. And, and here's just a selection, a smorgasbord, if you like, um, that we can look at it from the point of view of gender history. Obviously, in the late Victorian period, huge changes for women. You know, we have the Married Women's Property Acts of 1870 and 1882, whereby women could um, uh, retain their legal identity and could own assets. They're also entering the workplace and had more money, um, which um, they could uh, control and have financial agency over. So maybe marriage settlements weren't as important as before. But it wasn't just women, men also. Um, were changing. Most trustees were men, but not all of them. But the male trustees um, were expected to act, and here I quote, as ordinary prudent men, whatever that might mean. 
Um, and in the Victorian period, uh, the expectation of how they behaved um, was pulling them in all different kinds of directions, I think. So we could look at it from gender history. We could look at it from finance and business history. Within most um, trustees, there would be an investment clause, which is what could the trustees actually do with the money? And here's just a, a, an example of a marriage settlement from 1875. It's from uh, the Carlisle Archive Centre. And what you see here, the bit in red, is all kinds of things um, that the trustee could um, uh, invest in. Public stocks, funds, government securities in the United Kingdom, in India, colonies, dependencies. Lots of different investment instruments such as funds, shares, debenture, debenture stocks, mortgages or securities. And what we also see here is an opening up in terms of investment opportunities in terms of municipal uh, cities, you know, Leeds, Liverpool, Bristol, we're all um, uh, putting out bonds to, to um, fund the expansion of their infrastructure, but the colonies and also other dependencies, and also even uh, more difficult, there's a little bit at the end which says, well, even if that doesn't give you enough to invest in, you could actually show some discretion if you like. So in a period of huge expansion of capital markets and places in which to invest assets, the trustees were somehow supposed to figure out what was the best thing to do for their um, beneficiaries. This leads us on to another angle to take a look at marriage settlements from, which is family and life cycles. Um, uh, marriage settlements uh, usually had at least two generations to think about. Um, sometimes even more, they, they went on to the sort of the daughter, the grandchildren, and then the great-grandchildren. This could lead to cross-generational tensions because trustees were being asked to manage assets, but were they managing them for the benefit out and out for the, the initial beneficiaries, or were they trying to build up the assets for ever-increasing generations? So in terms of risk, did you try and avoid risk because you just wanted to protect the money for whoever came next? Or were you actually trying to take on a bit of risk to actually um, build up some more money so that it was available for everybody when it, when, when it got to that generation? There was also a tension between um, life tenants, so where you had property, um, somebody was in that property. Um, versus the remainder men, the people who got the property afterwards. So for family and life cycles, there's a lot of questions that come up. There's a lot of work that's been done before the late Victorian period, especially pre-19th century. Many of you might know the work of Amy Erickson, but there's quite a lot that was done for the early modern period. So that's another way, compare and contrast, if you like, that you can look at this uh, in the later period. We can look at it from a cultural historian's point of view. Uh, there's lots of visual representations and as I was saying there's lots of court cases so the discourse that surrounds the newspaper commentary about trustees and their responsibilities and whether or not they were doing a good or a bad job is a very rich source. Uh, another source to look at of course is fiction. Um, the untrustworthy trustee is um, a mainstay of quite a lot of these, uh, uh, the late Victorian uh, novels. Just to give one example, in The Three Clerks by Trollope, or Three Clerks by Trollope, uh, 1858, um, a, 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 a person goes wrong, a trustee, he dips into the trust fund, somebody he was supposed to be protecting, and not only does he get to sent to jail, but for his sins, he's sent to Australia. Apparently, uh, that was the, the, the worst kind of thing that could happen to you. Uh, we can look at this from global history. Um, different countries or different regions try to deal with the same question that marriage settlements was trying to deal with uh, in the UK. So uh, Mooring and Wall in their recent Widows in European Economy and Society talk about the fact that in Scandinavia marriage settlements were not so common but retirement contracts were. Uh, which specified agreed terms for the upkeep of a widow and it was signed up to by the husband but also by the children. Um, and in England we had dower and, and jointure but, but it's not quite the same. So there's lots of compare and contrast we can do on a global scale as well. 
But one I want to talk about finally is about parliamentary and legal history. As I said before, the trusts were dealt with or the cases were brought before the Court of Chancery. So there was a lot of cases and case law uh, or, or that were being decided during the late Victorian period. But at the same time, Parliament was also developing a lot of laws. There were successive trust and trustee acts during the second half of the 19th century. And in 1895, there was a select committee on trust administration. Um, uh, um, and, 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 all, and, and in addition to this, um, there were a lot of changes that were happening to do with marriage and divorce laws at the same time. So again, for trustees and trusts, this was just a rapidly changing environment that these poor trust, uh, trustees with personal liability somehow had to, to, to navigate. Now, given all my enthusiasm for all the different directions for marriage settlements, you might think this is my speciality, but it's not. My research is actually into women investors in the, in the late, latter part of the Victorian period. And marriage settlements obviously come into this, um, and, and especially because of the investment portfolio, you know, the investment clauses that I showed you before. Uh, they're all within scope, but, but they're not at all the sole focus. They're an important sliver of, of my research. And unfortunately, I'm not a legal historian. Um, and so trying to understand the legal aspects um, of marriage settlements means that I do need to rely on secondary sources, which comes to the problem I'm grappling with. When we talk about, especially the work of trust and trustees, in Victorian periods, there is one secondary source. It's Chantel Stebbings, the private trustee in Victorian England. Um, it's 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 a, um, a a terrific book, I have to say, and it's it's a really interesting read. Um, it was published in two thousand and one, and at the time, it was very positively uh, peer reviewed in history journals. Um, and it was widely and has been widely cited subsequently. It's one of those things that if you're reading an article or a book and there's an interesting reference to do with trusts or trustees, as your eyes leisurely go down to the footnotes, you just know in the back of your heads, yep, it's going to be Stebbings, and it is. So very much the go-to person. Um, however, in terms of the peer reviews and history reviews, um, there were two areas where scholarly reservations um, uh, were brought forward uh, and unfortunately they very much affect my usage of, of, of this source. The first one was to do with uh, asking for or requesting greater engagement with the historiography. Now Professor Stebbings is still working, she, she's um, at Exeter University but interestingly she's in Exeter Law School, not in the History Department and this probably speaks a lot to the fact that she um, wrote this book more from the legal rather than necessarily the historian's point of view um, and so in terms of engaging with historiography of other legal historians there's some but there's not a huge amount so trying to follow those different strands of the historiography is difficult um, if you're just relying on Stebbings. Uh, the second one was looking, although um, Stebbings does a fabulous job of working her way through all the different law cases uh, and also the, the statutes that came up, she does include some primary case studies but they're relatively narrow. Um, most of them are drawn from the Devon Records Office. I'm afraid we're going to have to um, ask you to wind up as soon as yep. Okay, just about that. So, so, so from the Devon Records Office and her work is really focused not on this subsequently but more on taxation. So although there is a large historiography of legal and parliamentary history, in terms of that crossover to trustees, I am reliant on Stebbings. So I'd love to know if other people have had this experience of reliance on a single source or maybe some suggestions as to how I can uh, move on as it were. Uh, sorry if I overran and thank you for your time. Thanks very much Hazel, that was really interesting.